Today's aha moment comes when a strange way during a story found in Mark 7, verses 24 through 31. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house, and he did not want anyone to know that he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him. And she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee and the region of Decapolis. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now I'd like to call on Don and Dave to uh, perform a special number. It'll set the tone for our message today. It's a song by the group Mercy Me, and it's titled Unaware. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Pastor Mike, and thank you, Mike, as well, and thank you to the wonderful choir. This song here, uh, when we uh, speak and we actually have the uh, testimony here, do you want the testimony now? Or no, 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 just go ahead and sing. Go ahead and sing first, <laughs> all right. <laughs> but uh, this song, there's some poignant words in this song, and when you uh, hear the testimony and Pastor Mike and I talk, you'll understand why. Forgive me if I stare, but I am taken back that you would let me hear, regardless of my past. Oh, my hands are shaking now. As I catch my breath somehow Oh, I am free at last Unaware of my fears Unaware of my shame Nothing else matters here but glorifying your name. Unaware of everything, knowing you're aware of me. Tell me how I got here I couldn't make it on my own Just tell me I can stay Cause this feels so much like home Oh, I lose all track of time When I look into your eyes your love is all I know Unaware of my fears Unaware of my shame Nothing else matters here but glorifying your name Unaware of everything Knowing you're aware of me Unaware, 
I'm in a place I shouldn't be. If you weren't there to call my name and rescue me. Unaware of my fears, unaware of my shame, nothing else matters here but glorifying your name. I'm unaware of all my fears, I'm unaware of all my shame. Nothing else matters here but glorifying your name. I'm unaware of all my fears. I'm unaware of all my shame. Nothing else matters here but glorifying your name. I'm unaware of all my fears. I'm unaware of all my shame. Nothing else matters here but glorifying your name. What a wonderful what a what a wonderful way to glorify Jesus Christ. Amen. And our Lord is a wonderful Lord that he is aware sometimes when we're unaware of our faults and our failures and our sins. And you'll soon know some of the uh, sinful ways of life that I lived. It's not something I'm proud about, but God has transformed me. I've given my life to him, and it's a wonderful new journey. I'm unaware that I still breathe Unaware of everything Knowing you're aware of me Of me Of me I'm unaware that I still breathe. I'm unaware. I'm unaware of everything. Knowing you're aware of me. It had to feel so good for the two of you to be back together again. They used to perform in a Don Haynes band uh, that was pretty famous throughout uh, Columbus. And uh, well, I don't know about that famous part. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it. It sounds good. <laughs> uh, well, let me first of all say something about our scripture, and then Don and I are going to talk about its relevance to us this morning. We've been thinking about these aha moments where we're sure that it's Jesus present or it's because of Jesus that we're, we have this new revelation, uh, this new epiphany, this new understanding. Aha, things come clear. I want you to consider something this morning. Could Jesus himself have had an aha moment? Remember in Scripture, in Luke, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. Let's pray. So come into this moment, Lord. You've already been in the sanctuary 
but uh, touch this time we have together so that we may have a deeper understanding of your majesty, of your power, your glory, how even when you walked this earth, things were being revealed to you as they are being revealed to us in this hearing. Amen. So we have Jesus going up into an area along the Mediterranean coast uh, into what was then the district of Syria. It's Lebanon today. In a town called Tyre. And he's trying to get away. Jesus is, is exhausted. The press of the crowds have really taken a toll on him. A beautiful toll. You know how you have these good tireds, don't you? Uh, he's, he's having a good tired, but needs to escape, as Scripture tells us. And he is in a home in Tyre, and all of a sudden, a Syrophoenician woman breaks on the scene. Now, it was pretty bold to be a woman to break on the scene in front of a rabbi, who's trying to rest. It's another thing to be of Syrophoenician uh, descent. There was very bad blood between Syria and Israel. And even though I don't have time, if you looked at some of the uh, passages, we call them intertestament passages, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, you'll find that there was a king, uh, Antiochus, who one of the th stories, and it's detailed in gory um, extent, uh, there were seven brothers and a mother brought before him because they refused the king's food, which was uh, pork, swine. And because they refused to eat that as good Jews following the dictates of Moses, each one of them, individually, in front of the others, was tortured in incredible ways and died, one brother after another. Tongues would be cut out, hands would be cut off, bodies would be thrown into a cauldron of uh, boiling liquid, one after another, watching this. And then the same thing happens to the mother. Those stories were circulating throughout Israel. And that was one of the contributing factors to the bad blood between Syria and the people of Israel. But this woman and her boldness uh, is what really uh, caught the attention of our Lord. Now, a lot of people try to soften Jesus' words because we don't, he doesn't sound too Jesus-like in this passage. She begs him to cast out a demon from her daughter. And what does he tell her? Let the children be fed first. That's the children of Israel. For it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. They were considered dogs. Not too Christ-like, is it? But the woman boldly uh, responds to Jesus. Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Now here's what I want you to consider for as an aha moment for Jesus. Up to this point, his mission has been to the people of Israel, the children of God. And that's where he thought that, his, that he had been called. But now this Gentile, this other 
this Syrophoenician woman is before him. And, he, and she boldly responds to his words. To me, it's almost as if he has this aha moment and probably looked up to God. and thought, there's more to my mission, isn't there, Lord, than just to the people of Israel. And he tells her, for saying that, you may go, the demon has left your daughter. Listen to verse 31 again. She goes home and finds her daughter well. Then it says, he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. Remember last Sunday when I was telling you about the Decapolis? The ten cities, the ten Gentile cities? He has maybe this aha moment and decides, if this is part of my mission, then I need to go into the land of the Gentiles. And he goes into the land of the Gentiles, off the Sea of Galilee, the other side, remember, of the sea that we were talking about last Sunday. He's met by a man that is deaf, and he heals him. And then he gets out of the boat and um, is met by a man that, that has a legion of demons. We dealt with that story last Sunday, the demoniac. And he casts out 2,000 demons that were within this man. Tells this man to stay and preach the good news and the mercy of God to the Gentile people throughout the Decapolis. He leaves, comes back. And 4,000 are waiting for him and hang with him for three days. And then he feeds them on seven loaves and a few fish. Could it be that Jesus never knew fully the extent of his mission until the Syrophoenician woman came and begged him on behalf of her daughter to the Lord. You know, we often wonder, even though Jesus was a Jew and his, all of his apostles were Jews, why did they have such a hard time going outside of the uh, Jewish area? Why was it so hard for Paul to, uh, to take that mission to what now becomes uh, you and me? Why was it so hard to become an ecumenical church? Until we think of today. Why is it so hard for us to be an inclusive body of Christ? We raise barriers, both visible and invisible, all the time. Things that separate us. And we have to have one denomination after another to figure out how it is that we stay within the rules of how we understand the Lord, but people get left out. And sometimes it's hard to break in to the kingdom of God. I th we thought about Don's life, and he's going to tell you about uh, where he's come from. And he's spent 10 years away from us, out of the mainstream of society. Society is not going to be all that forgiving no matter what you do when you're away. But there's something about this Lord of ours that allow you to figure out how you get over and around and under the barriers. Tell us your story, Don. And go through. And go through. Those barriers. Go through those barriers. Um, just a brief run down here. Um, grew up in the south end of Columbus, South High School, and I'm um, going to pedal forward through all this and uh, was married uh, 16 years, had two wonderful children, and um, 
part of the divorce was uh, earning shared parenting. And that's very important. So I had my home with my sons and I and shared parenting and uh, lost my job. And job searched for about uh, eight months or so and couldn't find anything. And again, there was a lot of things tying up to this, but uh, ultimately, using my free will, made some very bad decisions. Never had a life of crime. And I actually did three aggravated robberies that led me to a 13-year sentence in prison. So I stand before you as someone who uh, had a wonderful praying grandmother that I knew had, had, you know, was praying for me all through my childhood. So I knew of God, but I didn't have a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And it took me getting on my knees in the county jail in Franklin County and saying, God, this is my words very similar to this. Lord, I don't know if you're real. This seems like a head game I'm going through, but people have been planting seeds in my life. And I understand that if I stay in the Word of God daily, and I stay in prayer daily, and I stay in fellowship, you will reveal yourself to me. I held up to my end of the deal, and our mighty Lord held up to his end of the deal. Amen. And from that day forward, my life began to transform. I would read scripture, and I would just ask the Lord, help me to take these words and transform my life. And it made me look at my childhood. It made me look at my adult life. It made me look at the sin that was in my life. And, and just I asked God to put me in that refining fire that we know scripture talks about and to just transform my life. So I actually did nine years of a 13-year sentence. The wonderful part is I did three years at Ross Correctional three and a half at Marion, where my good friend of 25 years has been faithful by my side, uh, Dave and Michelle Gilley. Dave brought Pastor Mike up to the play at Marion Correctional. There would be a Christmas play and an Easter play, and about 2,000 people from the street come in. And that's where we met. And he's been a wonderful supporting brother ever since that time frame. You don't always know what, he probably doesn't want these accolades, but... Uh, how much he works behind the scenes and has really impacted my life in a positive way. But through my incarceration and this transformation, I've been singing for years, but always wanted to play an instrument. So I learned to play guitar and the trumpet and the keyboard while I was incarcerated. And God just blessed me to write about 200 roughly contemporary Christian songs. Used to do the bar scene years ago. I didn't care at all about secular music. It's all about Jesus Christ and contemporary Christian music. So the transformation really took place in my incarceration. And three months ago, uh, I'd say about a year ago, I applied for what's called judicial release, which is early release. And um, that went before Judge Richard Fry in the Common Pleas Court. And uh, I stand before you now as a free man because three months ago, Judge Richard Fry saw fit that I should be released early, three years off of my sentence early. And that really took that time frame in my incarceration of having an absolute perfect record. I had no record at all, no prior record. Should have never been there, but I've identified why, using again my free will to make stupid choices, uh, that led me there. and. Uh, took all types of program certifications of anger management, victims awareness, about 60, 70 certifications. We had a wonderful Bible college that came in the Ross Correctional called Christian Union Bible College. So I went to Bible college for three years. And God just placed all the right people at the right times, outside volunteers, outside churches that would come in to just totally transform my life. So in closing, I'd like to say that Prison for me was sort of like the uh, halftime of a football game. I mean, we don't have any football fans in here, right? <laughs> you know, go Bucks. that's right. <laughs> and you know, in the football game, or no one really cares who wins the first half, right? It's all about the W at the end, the win or loss, but hopefully the win. So I looked at prison as my halftime. You know, the coach at halftime, he re regroups the team. Well, prison for me was about God regrouping me as part of his team. And uh, so I'm excited about the second half of my life now 
because Jesus Christ is guiding my life. Because I know without Jesus Christ, I'm going to mess it up. And uh, that's been proven with the past. But uh, I'm excited about this uh, second half of my life to win the game of life and to store up my heavenly treasures and rejoice one day in a heavenly realm. Don, I uh, am so excited. <clears throat> so pleased, privileged that you are with us today and can talk about this second half because I promise you, with Jesus Christ, the second half will be so much more fulfilling than the first half. With that said, the beginning of the second half is going to be a challenge. Just as it was for Paul and all the apostles when they first started proclaiming the word, they weren't always received well. Paul was beaten and stoned and shipwrecked and, and they were all ultimately killed. And um, so you'll walk out no, no matter how many certifications you have, no matter what kind of education you've had, people still are going to wonder, is this guy for real? And does he really deserve uh, when everybody else ha- has a need for a job? Why should I give someone a job who's been in prison, who's offended against society? But as with any job, it's going to be built on relationships. So someone is going to be either touched very deeply by your story and who you are, or they're going to be touched because they know a Dave Gilly. And they might say, I'm not sure about Don, but I am sure about Dave. So I'll give him a chance. The neat thing about Don is he's willing to work anywhere to get off the ground. Ultimately, his goal is to be a worship leader and a, uh, and a good, strong Christian uh, uh, facility. Uh, he doesn't care what denomination uh, he's in. You know, isn't it interesting uh, as we contemplate uh, uh, this Lord of ours? After what happened with the Syrophoenician woman and, and his uh, mission that expanded, some of his last words in Matthew, uh, as he decides uh, what happens at the end of the world, how you separate the sheep from the goats, that it's how people will have dealt with the least of these. And he names the poor, he names the uh, hungry, he names the naked, he names the lonely, and he names the imprisoned. How we treat those who have been locked away for their own, by their own uh, doings. Because it's all about mercy. It's all about mercy. It's, it's God's mercy on us. Now we, most of us haven't been locked away in the prisons of the world, but some of us have been locked away in the prisons of our own lives. Uh, and we need mercy too. And all of a sudden, there's a common ground at the foot of this cross. And when we can share that common ground together, the world changes and begins to look a whole lot like the heaven that you're going to sing about uh, in the years to come. So pray for Don Haynes. What was the name of your group before you went to prison? I thought, just the Don Haynes, and you played at the Americana, and uh, you were all over, and how many of you guys were there, Dave, that played together? Well, I don't know, five or six or so, and uh, even had some wonderful opportunities to step out on the ice and sing the national anthem for the Blue, Columbus Blue Jackets. Wow. And uh, so there was some pinnacle moments, and uh, wonderful. Was this, was this back when you had longer hair? Uh, I don't know. Did I ever have long hair? <laughs> I had long hair in the county jail. I remember that. It was tough to get a haircut there. <laughs> well, we, we give you thanks for being present and, and for boldly proclaiming both in song and in word uh, how this Lord is uh, to you and, and, uh, and reminds us who he is to all of us. So let's pray together for for Don. Lord, you've laid a claim on Don from the moment he was born, but your grip has found him 
in a dark corner of a isolated prison setting. And you've captured him in your holy snare now where he was trying to get out of prison, but he'll never want to get out of your love and your embrace. Assure him when the moments don't seem to be coming into full fruition as quickly as he would want them to. Uh, let him give him patience and let him know that in the patience and in the endurance, he's, you're building holy character within him. That even this waiting and even this frustration will be a part of his testimony in the years ahead. Uh, so make a mighty servant. Uh, continue to make one in him. And may he proclaim you wherever he goes. Because he goes in your name, Jesus. Amen.